thank you all for coming tonight. I'm Kelly. I am the community outreach coordinator at the, the Mid-Atlantic office. So as you're walking along and you see things that look like they were dropped from the sky perfectly for you to step on or follow through, that was likely done by a volunteer. When you see the path kept clear, that was done by a volunteer. When you see that there's no poison ivy right in front of you, probably picked up by a volunteer. And then Dennis here is one of our, our, our volunteers with the uh, Susquehanna Appalachian Trail Club. And volunteering to lead hikes is just one of the many things that he does. So make sure you give him a thank you on your way tonight, too. We have two other people to thank. Jim Schollis is with the Department of Conservation, Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. He's a geologist, and he is our guest expert extraordinaire for the evening. And as I told you in the car on the way up here, we get two for the price of one tonight. So behind you, hiding with his Superman shirt on, which is so appropriate, <laughs> is our second geologist for the night, Mike Stefanik. So thanks to both of them for giving their time tonight. Leave no trace. As we go along, please feel free to take as many pictures as you want, ask as many questions as you want, but please don't take anything else. And try, to stay, try your best to stay on the treadway at all times so that we don't disturb anything on either side. So we are standing now sort of in the middle of what we call South Mountain, at the northern end in the middle. And this is the northernmost terminus of the Blue Ridge Physiographic Province, and this extends all the way from up here around where we're at, Bowling Springs, Dillsburg area, all the way down Tennessee along the Appalachian front, front, front range of the Appalachian Mountains. So we uh, are sort of at an end point here for the Blue Ridge. A lot of rocks in sort of all different directions. Well, those are rocks that have originated from higher up on the slope. So this area right here didn't always look like this, probably looked a lot different in the past. So, I just want you to look at these rocks right here that we're standing on. You see that they're sort of all tilted, if you want to say there's a flat plane here, sort of tilts up in this direction. Okay. Pull back a few years then, any? A few years. Huh? Just a few. Yeah. Quartz in all these rocks, the main component of the rocks that we've been walking through. And I'll give you the name of the formation, it's called the Weaverton Loudon Formation. The geologists are always trying to divide the rocks so they can make sense out of them, because if you just have one big package of rocks, it's hard to really study it. If you can subdivide the group of rocks into smaller categories, smaller groups, uh, that's what you want to try to do. So the formation is the basic unit that we use to map it. Whoa! So like, is it like, it's just like flat. <laughs> yeah, it's Yeah, what we're looking at right here, you see a rock that has large, like little rocks inside it. Quartz. And these are called pebbles. And so when you have a rock that's made up of a large size a particle in it, like this, what we call here a, uh, a pebble, and we have a matrix that's much finer grain that sort of holds these all together. We're calling this a conglomerate. So this is what we would call a sandstone conglomerate. And it's a type of sedimentary rock that if you see it, you can tell it apart from rocks like that's just above it here. It's a little hard to see, but where the conglomerate sort of disappears. You don't see it anymore. When we get up here a little farther, we will uh, have an opportunity to look at a much better exposed section of that. And we'll explain a little more what that means geologically and why it's important for us to uh, be able to recognize that in these rocks and helps us to understand the actual evolution of this landscape and the, the structural history that's occurred here in South Mountain. Here's the conglomerate you saw up there. See the pebbles in it? Now, if you look 
Beside it, you see an interval here that doesn't have all these pebbles, like up in through here. And then on the other side, here's another interval. It doesn't have the pebbles. And over here, it's pebbles again. What we have here are what we call bedding plates. How do we know where these layers came from? Where did, where did the sediment originate? Well, back, we dated these rocks to be, I believe, 560 million to 570 million. You mica, that's what was weathering off of it. Put, produced these layers, so you see the layers in the rocks. Now, whenever that was produced and laid down, it was flat lined. Not like it is right now. Now it's standing up 65 degrees, dipping to the north. Uh, well, here we go. We got <coughs> South Mountain is what's called a anticlinorium. So we have an anticline of falls. Everybody know what an anticline is versus a syncline? An anticline is when you have like a, a dome. Like a, I can do it there. It's a dome, like that. And a syncline is just the opposite. Like that. Now I'm going to say, okay, well if that's bedding, what am I looking at right here? What are all these lines here? They're running this way. That looks like it could be bedding too, but remember, Bedding is where you change your lithologic description, where you change your composition of your rock. It's not continuous. Bedding plane is continuous. It runs for long, long distance, hundreds of feet or maybe even miles. The pebbles that normally should be round are not round. They're all flat. The pebbles in the conglomerate beds are elongated like this. And that is in a southeast direction. Why is that? Because they were formed at a different time, under different conditions. These boulders right here you see are a result of the glaciers, but not because they were here, just because of the climate that was here. We had a periglacial climate from about 2 million Years it started, we had three glaciation periods that came into Pennsylvania. This became a very, uh, this area was cold without vegetation. Some breaks in a particular pattern, we call it orthogonal jointing. And they kind of form regular rectangular blocks. So it's not, unco it's not uncommon, it's, it's natural for it to have these sort of pseudo right angles and kind of a blocky texture instead of these nice rounded boulders that you see other places. <laughs> This is uh, Weaverton quartzite, and there's the acid, and you can see nothing, no, no reaction at all to that. So, if I <laughs> subject both of those surfaces for millions of years to chemical weathering, let's say acid rain, what do you think is going to happen? That one's going to be much more diminished, it's going to get lower. This one's going to sit there and go, well, is something going on? <laughs> no? Really? Is this all you got? And it's going to sit there for millions of years and not really weather much at The other all. thing that's going on here is this rock doesn't have any openings between the grains where water can get in to weather the rock. So it's pretty much been re-cemented and this rock is then very resistant to weathering. The only thing that's going on is the mechanical, physical weathering up there, which the freezing and thawing in those joints and cleavage surfaces we had, we saw where it breaks open, water gets in there, wedges it apart, freezes, wedges it apart.